Picking up where we left off, I'm going to show you a feature within the grid itself, and then we'll go to the bottom left corner and then go clockwise. Within the grid, you can right-click and bring up a horizontal axis screen and recenter the grid and then also change the interval. So let's change the interval to $2, click OK, and watch how it changes. Let's go back to a buck fifty. And you can see that that's a very quick and easy way of changing this around. Now, let's go to the bottom left corner, but I'm going to resize this so that we can see everything clearly. So let's go ahead and expand this fully. I'm also going to close this ribbon down by left-clicking on the logo in the top left corner, hide the ribbon, and there we are. Going to the bottom left corner, you'll see the position of the wand is set at 242.95. That's right there, and as I change the wand, that value will change accordingly. Moving up above, the objectives and stops, we'll address that in the status screen. The break-evens can come up that will show you the intersection of the, uh, uh, the actual risk line with the zero break-even line, and that value is shown there as well. Now we can toggle that off if you want. Moving up above, we have some very important features the target, and the current bell curve. Now, you also see underneath the, ex, uh, uh, the expected return value, the standard deviation, and then the probability of profit. Let's go ahead and I'm going to expand this out a little bit. Let's go to $1, like so, and let's go out to the expiration line. Now, let's discuss the expected return first. And to do this, I need to grab my little drawing tool. And so expected return calculates the value by looking at 11 data points from across either the target or in this case, because we're using the bell curve, we're going to use that. So let me, in fact, um, okay, let's uh, there we go. So let's go to the bell curve. And what we do is we have to show um, nine different excuse me, 11 different data points from across this bell curve. One on each of the ends there. Then we have nine in the middle. So there's going to be one, say, two, three, say, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. These are equidistant from each other. So we look at, at 11 data points from across the bell curve. And then we take those data points and equate those with the actual risk line. All right, and so we're about right there, 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 and there. So what we do is we take each of these 11 data points, average them together, each multiplied by their probability of occurrence to then get the expected return. In this case, when you take all of that, it adds up to an average of minus $62. That's the expected return, each data point multiplied by its probability of occurring. The standard deviation of those 11 is $1,080 in this case. And uh, that would be the expected return taken over the uh, width of the bell curve. Okay. Now, probability of profit is something a bit different, so let's go to that. Notice here that at 33%, um, uh, we take our bell curve, all right, our standard deviation, first and second standard deviation. We note that the uh, expiration line intersects the zero break even right about there, meaning that this area that is profitable constitutes roughly, looks like about 33% of that bell curve defined by the first and second standard deviation below. From this point all the way over to here, the border of the second standard deviation, that looks indeed like about 66%. Well, 60, uh, yeah, it, you know, it's a third, 33 and a third, 66 and two thirds, etc. Okay, so that's what you're seeing here is that the the, the, the greater portion of the first and second standard deviation occupied by a profitable area means that that probability of profit will be higher. So visually, that's what you're seeing here. Okay. Now, notice we can go to target. Right now, we are on bell curve. Uh, oh, one final thing. On bell curve, 
that is defined, the width of the bell curve is defined by this volatility input, in this case of 6.9%. That can be altered. Let me go back to the matrix, go to the S button, and that is by default, the input is the most recent 20-day statistical volatility. We can change that value, and we may want to make it an at-the-money call, at-the-money put value, or something else that you choose. Well, let's go ahead and type in 7.5 up here. Hit Enter. When we go back to Analyze, we now note that the input is 7.5. Okay, our probability of profit also expanded by two percentage points with that alteration. So you can customize the volatility input going into the calculation of your probabilities very easily that way. Now, let's explore target. Let's click on target. Go to the target button. We click that target button. That brings up a target screen where we have to define uh, where we feel that this is this is going to go, uh, the spider, where it's going to go. So we can select a bell curve and then alter the center price, either bullish or bearish. In this case, let's just take a price range of, say, oh, I'm going to say 242 to the low side. And let's say we feel that it could go up to 246 and that it could do that as of, say, oh, uh, T plus... 12 days from now. T plus 12 days. Enter. Now when I click OK, um, that is a single, oh I see. Um, what did I do? Oh, let's just a second. Target. Oh, high price. 246. Enter. There we go. That should make it. There we go. There we get that shaded region I wanted. So this is our projected target where we feel this could go. Now it's going to calculate then the expected return with those 11 data points as of the width of this target. All right, so, uh, you know, it's kind of a narrow target. Let's expand this out. Let's say we're a bit more optimistic. Let's go to 248, click OK. That expands it out. So now the system is going to take those 11 data points from the width of this target, okay, equal 11 equal 11 data points equally distributed, and now we have a positive expected return because quite a bit of this is certainly very profitable relative to those that are down here. All right, so that's how you can use target, and you can of course customize that uh, in, in, in you know with with quite a bit of uh, savviness. You can make a date range to occur over a certain range of prices, in which case the expected recur return comes from um, three lines instead of one, or a total of uh, 33 data points instead of just 11. All right, now let's move on up. From here we have the uh, uh, features where we can resize the graphic analysis screen. We can also move it to the left or to the right, just using clicks like this. Um, vertical axis, we can make it say yield, so that on the uh, left side you would have the yield level, and on the right you would have the dollar amount. Okay, um, and that's relative to the amount provided up here. Here we're looking at original requirement. We have drop downs for you to enter by hand. You can use a maintenance requirement. In the case of certain spreads or even futures positions, etc., uh, we'll leave it there. You can propose volatility changes that will shift these lines up or down. And then we also have some fun with the uh, maximum projected date. Right now, it's set to expiration by default when you go to analyze. But notice that when you highlight this maximum projected date, you can then go to your keyboard, to the, uh, uh, to the bracket keys next to the letter P as in Papa, and you can click the left-hand bracket key to go down, the right-hand bracket key to go up, and alter that date. And as you do so, watch the line change, as well as watch the standard deviation lines uh, expand out as well. Very cool. 
Next, we go through, uh, go upward. We can go and change the number of lines from three to a maximum of five, or all the way down to just one if you want, between one and five lines. And then going over to the top right corner, we have the little arrows and the superimpose. We don't really have the ability to use those now, so what we have to do is go to the matrix. And notice that we were proposing a ratio right on top of the existing position. So I'm going to click on B, go to Analyze, and analyze both this long call with the ratio right. You see what's going to happen here? We're going to end up with a 7 lot here and a 7 lot there, or a debit spread. So let's click Analyze, and there we have it. We have that proposed trade on top of our long call, making for a bull call spread. Then when we go to the top right corner, that yellow arrow brings back the previous position. We can go back and look at the combined position right there. Then underneath we have superimpose. Look at this. We can click on superimpose and bring in the current position existing versus the debit spread in green. I'm going to clean this up and go to one line. And here you can evaluate this and determine which position is better and more reflective of your market view. What are we looking at here? At expiration, we can clearly see that the debit spread makes less money than the long call after it passes this particular point, right about there, 246. After it passes 246 look at, and, and change, the long call makes far more money than the debit spread. However, Short of that, the debit spread makes money, uh, makes more money anywhere between now and, uh, well, you can see it kicks in with a profit certainly earlier than the long call position, but it has this marginal level above the long call right through there. We can also have some fun with this and change the projected date and watch how these lines change and alter. Isn't that kind of cool? walking it through using my bracket keys, looking at how the position changes. Okay, and I think that is it. Oh, and to remove some of the stack here, you can just click the red X, and we'll go back to then toggling between the arrows like that, okay? And, and that's how you basically use the graphic analysis screen uh, with great detail. This concludes this presentation on graphic analysis part two.